Today's lecture is going to continue on the theme of stereograms. We'll begin with uh, the stereographic representation of point groups, and then we'll go on to discuss uh, systems other than cubic systems. So for example, hexagonal, orthorhombic, and so on, how to plot those on a stereogram. So we're going to talk about low symmetry systems after using stereograms to represent point groups. Now you remember we dealt with uh, this crystal of uh, gypsum, yeah, which has a, a twofold axis pointing normal to the 0, 1, 0 plane, and we have a mirror plane running through here. Okay? So just from the shape of the crystal, we decided that uh, the point group symmetry was 2 upon m, and this is the list of point groups as a function of the seven different crystal systems. So by looking at this list, you can decide that this crystal of gypsum is actually monoclinic in symmetry. Okay, so just by looking at the shape, you can decide that the crystal is monoclinic. And similarly, this was the crystal of epsomite, um, which has a point group symmetry 2, 2, 2, uh, with di dyads running through this edge, this other edge, and one dyad vertical. And if you look at this, 2 to 2 belongs to the orthorhombic crystal class. Okay, so again, from the shape, you can decide that this is an orthorhombic crystal structure. The details of it, you would need diffraction to resolve, but at least you know that A does not equal to B, does not equal to C, and the angles are all 90 degrees. So that's a good start to analysis of structure. And yesterday, I demonstrated to you that uh, the bar 2 operation, that means a rotation of 180 degrees followed by an inversion through the center of symmetry, is exactly equivalent to a uh, mirror plane. And to do that, I plotted a circle here, which now you recognize as a stereogram. And then I put a pole uh, at an arbitrary position. So we call this a pole of a general form. Okay? So this is a pole that I placed at an arbitrary position to represent the projection of this normal through the south pole onto the uh, equatorial plane. And following this rotation, uh, 180 degrees and inversion through the center, we see that in fact bar to m is exactly the same as a mirror plane passing through the equatorial plane. Okay? So, to represent point group symmetries, you know, the tables that we had previously, there are 32 uh, point groups here. To represent those, we could simply use stereograms to see how the symmetry operations work. So, supposing we wanted to represent uh, the operation um, of a tetrad, then I draw a circle, put a tetrad in the middle, and then I put a point somewhere. Uh, which is a pole of the general form. So here is my stereogram now, and I put a point there which represents any normal to any arbitrary plane. Okay, so it's a pole of a general form. Where will this go when I rotate by 90 degrees? Well, it will end up somewhere here. Yeah? And similarly, another 90 degree operation there and there. So you can see that the presence of the tetrad means that if I put a point over here, then I necessarily must have these points as well. Okay? So this is the stereographic representation of the point group 4. Yeah. Now, does this point group have a center of symmetry? So, Jehun, you said yes, yeah? So, where, where, how, how can it have a center of symmetry? Because those two are actually like this in three dimensions. What would this look like if, it was a, if there was a center of symmetry? There would be a circle here, wouldn't there? Because you're going through the middle. Yeah? So this is a point group which does not have a, a center of symmetry. Yeah? So in order to have a center of symmetry, Sure, you have to look on the opposite side, but it will be a circle as opposed to a filled pole because it's in the lower hemisphere of the stereographic sphere. Everybody happy with that? Okay. 
So that's the representation of the point group four. This, uh, this has a center of symmetry, yeah? Bar 3M, because look, exactly opposite and underneath, you have another pole, okay? So I start uh, to construct this. I put a pole of the general form here. I then rotate by 120 degrees and invert through the center to get this point, yeah? So that gives me the bar three operation. Everyone happy with that stereogram? Okay, so I put an arbitrary pole over here. Uh, a triad means a rotation of 120 degrees. So I do that, and the bar means that we invert it through the center. So that's my representation of the bar three operation, okay? an inversion triad. Okay, so these now are the 32 different crystallographic point groups, and they're classified, you know, this is basically the stereographic representation of the table that I showed in the first couple of slides of the 32 point groups. So, for example, when we look at the monoclinic, you'll remember that we had the uh, gypsum as 2 upon m. So, uh, a rotation of 180 degrees here, and there's a mirror plane in the horizontal plane. And similarly, you can represent all the different point groups uh, using stereograms. And the cubic one is the most crowded. It's, it's the most symmetrical crystal system that we have. So it's not surprising that this looks uh, pretty um, complicated. But we did this yesterday. You know, there's a, there's a tetrad in the middle, and all the cube edges correspond to tetrads. We have the four triads along the body diagonals of the cube. And then we have the dyads corresponding to the 110 type directions. Yeah? Now, within this uh, uh, classification, we have these two rows. Uh, this is row number three and row number seven, where the crystals have centers of symmetry. Okay, so you can see th this is the bar three that we just did. Now, for those which do not have a center of symmetry, you'll get interesting properties. You know, for example, piezoelectricity, because when you deform the crystal, you know, charges will be displaced asymmetrically, and therefore you will get an electrical discharge. Okay, so just to show you an example of how that works, um, okay, this is just again to illustrate that we have a center of symmetry. Um, another point group, if I place, uh, if, if we have a point group MMM and I place a pole of uh, the general form over here, then I've got three mirror planes at 90 degrees to each other, and therefore I generate all of this. Incidentally, if you look at the one on the right, uh, where we are putting the symmetry elements, so this is the diet, 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 yeah? And if we go back to the previous uh, slide, we have a triad here. Then whenever this line is heavy, if you look at your printed table, yeah? Whenever this is a bold line, that implies a mirror plane, okay? When it's a narrow line, it's just a line. But if it is a heavy line like this, then those are mirror planes, and here we have three mirror planes at 90 degrees to each other. <coughs> so in your printed copy, you know, you'll be able to distinguish this more easily, the bold line and the narrow line. Okay. Right, so this is an uh, interesting uh, structure. It is uh, um, lead, titanium, and oxygen, lead titanate. And it's a peculiar structure because you know, it isn't that I've drawn this inaccurately, but look, this, this, for example, doesn't lie exactly at the corner, okay? So these are the lead atoms, and they're, they're, there's a certain height above that corner. All of these are not located exactly on the corner, and similarly, this is not located exactly on the half, half, half position, okay? And furthermore, the displacement of this above half, half, half is different from the displacement of 
the latitum about that position, which means that if I deform it, then the charges will be displaced asymmetrically. So we will get piezoelectricity. Yeah? Now, can you tell me the point group symmetry of this atom? So this is the titanium atom. What are the symmetry elements passing through that point? Uh, remember, this is, uh, I should tell you that this is a tetragonal structure. Tetragonal means A equals B, but not equal to C, and all the angles are 90 degrees. Sorry? Yeah, so there's a four-fold axis of symmetry passing through there. And two-fold. Yeah. Um, you, you're right. Uh, well, there's a two-fold axis as well, but is there a mirror plane is what I'm after. Yeah. yeah. So there's a four-fold axis going that way. Then there's a mirror plane vertical here. Any, any more mirror planes? Um, no, 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 horizontal doesn't have it. Yeah, because remember, this is not exactly at the center. Yeah, that's right. So one, mi one mirror plane passing through there and one mirror plane passing through there. So you would say it has a point group symmetry? 4 mm. Yeah, so you've got a, a fourfold axis and two mirror planes parallel to that axis. And similarly, if you think about it, this will also have a point group symmetry of 4 mm and uh, this one, but not this one, okay? This will have a different point group symmetry, uh, which I'll leave you to work out. But the point of showing you this is that this is a crystal structure which is peculiar in the sense that we do not have a center of symmetry. <coughs> and that's why we get this uh, piezoelectric or ferroelectric and all those properties associated with those structures. There is also uh, a class of point groups, which are listed over there, okay, where we have what's known as a unique direction. That means that direction is not related to any others by symmetry operation, including its negative. So 0, 0, 1 may not be the same as 0, 0, bar 1. Okay, so that's called a, a unique direction. And all of these point groups have that unique direction. And what it means is that we get uh, even more interesting phenomena. For example, pyroelectricity. So when we heat up the crystal, we will get a charge developing because we, uh, the thermal expansion itself causes an asymmetrical disposition of charges. So let me show you uh, a structure which exhibits, uh, which has a unique direction. Okay, so uh, before I go on to show you this, I will show you the actual crystal structure. We've got the stereogram here anyway. So this is, a, this is one unit cell, okay? It looks complicated, but what I'd like you to do is focus on this direction here, okay? Can you see that going up is not the same as going down along that direction? Can you see the distance here compared with the distance here? Yeah? So here, this direction is not the same as going backwards. Okay? And this crystal exhibits pyroelectricity. So by looking at the point group symmetries, you can actually think about what kinds of properties you expect from the crystal. Okay? Now, we'll learn a lot more uh, about point groups by using them in the lectures that follow, okay? But that essentially is the meaning of point group symmetry. Everybody happy with that? Okay? Right, so now we are going to start constructing stereograms of uh, crystal structures which are not as symmetric as a cubic system. And in the last lecture, I began by telling you that in the cubic system, you know, a 1, 2, 3 direction will also be normal to the 1, 2, 3 plane. But that is no longer the case when we have asymmetrical crystals. And here, here is an example. So this is a rectangular crystal, and this is the 1, 1 direction 
But this is the normal to the 1, 1 plane, because look, this is the 1, 1 plane. Yeah? So in general, these two will not be parallel. And they'll be further apart as the crystal becomes more and more asymmetric. So you cannot assume that in an autorhombic crystal, the 1, 2, 3 direction will be normal to the 1, 2, 3 plane. Okay? And that makes it complicated to plot stereograms, because in the cubic system, the stereogram is independent of the lattice parameter. So it doesn't matter what lattice parameter your cubic system is, everything will come at exactly the same position in a stereogram because we are representing angles. But those angles change if you take an autorhombic crystal with lattice parameters 2, 3, and 5 and compare with another autorhombic crystal with 2, 3, and 8. So the stereogram will be a function of lattice parameters as well. And furthermore, uh, it, you, if you have a stereogram which shows poles, that means plane normals, it will not be the same as a stereogram which shows directions. Okay, so I'll sh give you some examples of this now. <clears throat> so here is my cubic stereogram. You can see that uh, this direction here is exactly normal to this plane here. Okay, so if this is 1, 1, then this is uh, the normal to the 1, 1 plane. And this is my autorhombic crystal where this is the 1, 1 direction and this is the plane, uh, sorry, this is the 1, 1 plane normal and this is the 1, 1 direction and they're clearly not parallel. Now this is the cubic crystal which is independent of lattice parameters. Doesn't matter what lattice parameters you have, you get exactly the same stereogram because we are plotting angles here and the angles don't change when you alter the lattice parameter, right? Now I've got an autorhombic crystal which has the lattice parameters 2, 3, and 8. Okay, just arbitrary numbers. And you can see the dramatic difference between the autorhombic and the cubic crystal. So what's happened is that if you look at this normal here, the 1, 1, 1, let's assume this is a 1, 1, 1, then by distorting the unit cell, this has moved towards this axis. So look at this 1, 1, 1 here, and look at the position of the 1, 1, 1 here. Okay, so it's, it's moved downwards by distorting the cell upwards. Okay? Yeah, so the C axis here is bigger than the C axis over here. And that's why all these poles have moved towards the edge. Can you see that? Yeah? Okay. So this is an autorhombic, uh, a stereogram for the autorhombic system, and it looks completely different from that for a cubic system, as far as the locations of the poles are concerned. I'm now going to change the lattice parameter of the autorhombic system so that you can compare what happens when you alter the lattice parameter. Oh, sorry, I haven't finished on this one. So I was plotting these poles here. Uh, uh, this is the 0, 1, 1 pole, and because of the distortion, the 0, 1, 1 pole moves towards the edge. Okay? Right, now this is, uh, these are both orthorhombic crystals, but they have different lattice parameters. So here we had the c-axis equal to 8 units, and here we have 5, and you can see that the stereograms are not the same. So with autorhombic or any other crystal system which is not cubic, the stereogram becomes a function of the lattice parameters. Okay. You can, you can uh, download computer programs to plot these out. Okay? They're, they're free of charge. There are plenty of them available on the, on the web. So if you have a particular lattice parameter, you can just plot it very easily. Now, this is to show you the same crystal structure, exactly the same crystal structure and lattice parameters, but in this case I'm plotting the plane normals, and in this case I'm plotting the directions. So we now have two stereograms for the same crystal. In one case we are plotting the normals to the planes, and in the other case we are plotting the directions. So for example, um, okay, this is the the 1-1 one, one direction and this is the 1-1 one, one normal, plane normal. Now you can see that the plane normal 
um, which is here, okay, if, if we are talking about 111, quite dramatically moves towards the center because of the distortion associated with the unit cell. Yeah? So the directions look completely different from the plane normals. Uh, the stereogram for directions looks completely different from the stereogram for plane normals. Okay? So unfortunately, as soon as we move away from cubic systems, uh, you get complexity. Okay? And remember that cementite, which is you know, the most common uh, phase in steels, uh, after ferrite and austenite, is orthorhombic. Okay? Everyone happy with this so far? Okay, so we are now going to plot uh, a stereogram for the hexagonal system, where there is one further complication. Okay. Right, so this is our hexagonal system. Um, and before I put that up on the board, let me, let's try and uh, see whether you've understood something. So if I draw the projection of the hexagonal unit cell, then it will look <coughs> like this. So this is the origin, this is the x-axis, this is the y-axis, okay? And this plane here is the 1, 0, 0 plane, and this plane here is the 0, 1, 0 plane, because it intersects the y-axis at 1, doesn't intersect the z-axis at all, yeah? So I want to now draw the stereogram, okay? And I'll label x over here and y over here because we've got an angle of 120 degrees there, okay? So where does the 100 pole come on this stereogram? Can somebody tell me? So where does the normal to the 100 plane come on this diagram? <coughs> Any ideas? It's obviously going to be on the outer circle, on the perimeter, but where? Come on, be brave. Yeah. Between X and Y, but not exactly. What's the angle going to be? You are quite right. It won't be at X, it won't be at Y. Well, yep. 30 degrees. 30 degrees. Because look, to draw the normal to the plane, that's the normal, isn't it? Yeah? Here. So my 0, 1, 0 plane is actually here. And what, uh, sorry, 1, 0, 0 plane. And where is the uh, 0? Uh, where, where's the 010 plane? 30 degree from the y axis. Yeah. So it'll be somewhere here. Yeah? 0, 1, 0. And this is, of course, the vertical axis. So, so very often when people draw a stereogram for the hexagonal system, they assume that uh, you know, 100 zero, zero and 010 zero, zero will be at 120 degrees. But that's the directions, x and y axis. It's not the normals to the planes, okay? So that's where the normals to the planes will be in the hexagonal stereogram. So you can see that over here. <coughs> um, this is uh, the 100 plane and this is the 010 plane and there's an angle of 60 degrees here, okay? Uh, this is uh, uh, several hexagonal unit cells drawn together and you can see this is the normal to the 100 plane that I drew over here, and this is the normal to the 010 plane. Now, angle from here to here is 60 degrees, 
And you can see that in between these two, I will get uh, a plane which is the sum of these two. You remember we did this yesterday? Yeah. And if I go another 60 degrees over here, I get a bar 1, 1, 0 plane. So the 1, 0, 0 plane is this face. The 0, 1, 0 plane is this face. And the bar, uh, 1 bar 1, 0 plane is this face. Now can you see that there's something strange here? OK? That these three faces are exactly identical crystallographically, right? Because we've got hexagonal symmetry. Yeah. So this face really is no different from this face and this face. But isn't it strange that here it's 1, 0, 0, it's 0, 1, 0, and now it becomes bar 1, 1, 0. So the digits you know, for the same face are different. Yeah. In one case, we only have 1 and 0 and 0. In the other case, we have 1, 1 and 0. So if I, if I um, want to say that these faces are crystallographically equivalent, then I have to write that yeah, using the braces. But these numbers, the set of numbers, is not the same as this and this. Okay? So to make them appear the same, uh, Brave introduced a fourth axis. Okay? Instead of three axes, which is the 100, zero, 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 010, zero, and 001, zero, zero, we use what's known as the miller brave indices, where you add an extra index, i, where i is equal to h uh, minus h plus k. Okay? So if you look, the 100 zero, zero plane becomes 10 zero bar 10. So here is my fourth axis here, d. So the 100 zero, zero plane intersects x at 1. It doesn't intersect y. Okay? It intersects the third axis uh, in the horizontal plane at minus 1. Can you see that? And it doesn't intersect this. So that becomes 10 zero bar 10. Zero. Okay? Similarly, this plane here doesn't intersect the x-axis. It intersects the um, y-axis at 1. And it intersects the d-axis at minus 1, 0. <coughs> now, you see all of these appear to have the same combination of numbers. Yeah. So it's very easy. If you just take your HKL and you add a fourth number here, where i is equal to minus h plus k, then you've got your Miller-Brave notation for planes in the hexagonal system. Yeah, is everybody happy with that? Yes. And if you want to go back to the three, um, three indices, then you just strike that out, and you've recovered your threefold. But the point is that now all these planes appear to have the same, all crystallographically equivalent planes, appear to have the same permutation of digits. OK? So it's very easy to deal with uh, um, the four index system just by introducing a third axis in the uh, a fourth axis in the horizontal plane. Yeah. And the reason why you need to learn this is because a lot of the literature uses the four index system. Okay? So here is now uh, the modified stereogram where you know this, this, and this appear to have the same permutation of digits. OK, now we, we've got to uh, do the same thing for directions in the hexagonal system. In other words, you know, crystallographically equivalent directions should have the same permutation of digits. So we need to introduce a fourth index inside the notation for directions. But we have to do it in a way that it satisfies the Weiss zone rule. In other words, we still maintain uh, the HU plus uh, KV plus LW equals 0 if the direction lies in the plane. Yeah? So the Weiss zone rule was that HU 
plus KB plus LW equals zero. And we want to introduce uh, a different uh, y zone rule for the hexagonal system, where we say H capital U, so this is now the four index notation for uh, hexagonal system, plus K capital V plus I J plus <coughs> L into W equals zero. Okay. So uh, this is the fourth index in the plane notation, and this is the fourth index in the direction notation. And the additional condition that uh, J is equal to minus U, capital U plus capital V, okay? Just to be consistent with what we've done for planes, because we know that I is equal to minus H plus K, yep. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to substitute for capital J, uh, for, for I in this equation. So I get H capital U plus K capital V plus um, or minus H plus K into J plus L capital W equals zero. In other words, H into capital U minus J plus K into capital V minus J plus L capital W equals zero. Yeah. Now notice that this therefore equals this. Yeah, we are just comparing those two equations. This term here is exactly the same as that. In other words, U capital U minus capital J is equal to small u. And that is exactly equal to that. And of course, W is the same as W because the C axis is at 90 degrees to everything. Yeah? So you can convert between the four index notation for directions and the four index notation uh, and the three index notation for directions using this. And furthermore, you satisfy the Weissau rule even with the four index notation. So let me just uh, go through that again. So this is our normal Weiss zone rule, where you have HU plus KV plus LW equals zero. And we introduce a fourth index uh, in the plane notation, where I is equal to minus H plus K. And this is the Weiss zone rule for the four index notation. Uh, where this is our four index notation for directions, and we impose the condition that capital J is equal to minus U plus V, okay? So when we substitute for uh, I, small i, we, and compare the coefficients of this with the Weiss zone rule, you, you see that U minus J is equal to U, V minus J is equal to small v, and W must equal to W. Yeah, so just, just by comparing those coefficients, you see U minus J is equal to small u. And when we substitute for J in here, because we know that J is equal to minus capital U plus minus uh, capital V, this is the direct conversion between the four index notation for directions and four index notation uh, and three index notation. So here is the complete mapping of the four and three index notation for directions. Okay? Is everybody happy with that? So the complication comes because we still want the four index notation for directions to satisfy the Weiss zone rule. Okay? And in this case, you can't simply cancel out the third index. All right? You, you have to use these equations to convert. So, uh, in the four index notation, the one zero zero direction becomes this one here. So let me just show you that diagrammatically. So one zero zero is this axis, and I go if I if I go two along here or two thirds along here, okay and minus one along this axis, okay? 
and one along, uh, minus one along this axis, then I recover my one, zero, zero direction. So you can see the logic that one, zero, zero becomes this, zero, one, zero becomes this, and one, one, zero becomes this. So all of these have the same permutation of digits. And furthermore, this one, minus one, is equal to the sum of this multiplied by minus one, OK? So that's the four index notation for directions. And here is the general conversion between, between the indices. Everyone happy with that? So I, I don't think uh, it is a very difficult thing. You just have to get used to uh, plotting stereograms for asymmetrical systems other than cubic. And furthermore, the four index notation is only complicated for directions and not for planes. For planes, you know, you can just strike or, or add the third index very easily. Okay. Any, any questions? Okay, that's the end of the lecture today. Okay.